This week on Act Out, a special episode where we first briefly discuss what happened this past weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia. I'll issue a trigger warning, but I will also note that we will not show any video. Next, we take a look at an old decaying pipeline, a brand new one, and the company that craves more land and water for the sake of black gold. We talk with two indigenous youth activists who are standing up to the company and taking to the water to raise awareness and build resistance. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. August 12th, 2017, a civilian comrade citizen casualty, the do something, say something, stand up and scream, the why we do under a fascist regime. Overtly this time, say it with me one time, this is what fascism looks like. We all had it before, neath the surface in scores, the sons of Confederate chumps wave their guns, proudly remembering their ancestors brought bodies in chains then to tend to them, expected them all to survive these cruel times, and now they're all angry that they're surviving this century. Claiming white genocide as they march and seek heil, cause their masters taught them it's the blacks fault they're dying. Not corporate malfeasance or the shift in the seasons, the shit in your feed and the rape of your dreams, no. It's the Muslims. Trying to brainwash your women as you hold her back to be a broodmare for fascism, the Mexicans stealing your jobs, but they're lazy. No shit. Guess they're tired from fleeing the CIA, busting their homes for the drugs to be sold by the kingpins, the linchpins of black market gold. But the history here for these drones is a mystery. Hating the scapegoats, the system's own slaves, oh, the immigrants, difference, that's all just the same old. Easy to fit in those lines, no need to carve out a niche. This is Nazi chic, tried and true, red, white, and blue. If you're confronted with those who stand up to you, won't take the racist bait, yeah, they know you're a reprobate. See all the fascist hate spilling through cracks where you shoulda, coulda put facts in your mind so to find one of the many, some of the any, fallacies keeping you dumb and in line. But you cannot find a reason to aim high, to question the lies that now fester and rise. Take the low road. The wrong side of history is always smooth and flat and overused. So on the 12th of August, we came and you saw us, smashing the state of your privileged hate, your delicate rage, and you caved. When your creed proved to be meager and weak, a flimsy facade on a fascist pig god, a sexist and racist and capitalist fraud, the resistance and rising, the building and fighting, bear these sad tidings. You are wrong. You are fucking wrong. You will not win, and we will beat you back. And the day was just stacking up. Reality shows, and you know, we know, your grip's letting go. This backwards-ass roll spinning out of control. So on the 12th of August, you took your bold baseness, your racism lameness, the last of your day's hope, and gripped onto fear, hoping it'd steer you home. A hero for all of your kind. But low lives no longer get pedestals here. I thought this whole day would have made that quite clear. Her blood on your hands won't be that romance that you wove in an antebellum ode. Our hearts may be broken, but souls, they are bold. Whatever you thought to weed out was, has grown. We already know, and now more will soon know, that your slip and slide down the wrong side of history is one we the people cannot and will not condone. We are here, a line of linked arms in the aftermath. This sick crash hit you. Your ideas crumple like cheap metal fenders, and we stand with our hands raised to fists, fascist proof. And just one more line for the passiveists and the apathists. We don't want your damn pity or your profile sympathy. Get your ass in the streets. You're either with us or in his back seat. There are solidarity actions happening around the globe, as well as ways to contribute to expenses for the victims. We will post all of those links in the description, so please do take a look. Now, moving on. 
Back in 1968, Calgary-based energy delivery company Enbridge Incorporated, then known as Lakehead Pipeline, started pumping crude oil through a brand spanking new pipeline. Originating in Alberta, Can Alberta, Canada, and slicing southeast across the border to a terminal in Superior, Wisconsin. Built in 1962-63, the pipeline was constructed using defective coating that does not protect against corrosion and flash welded joints which, as the name suggests, are slapdash and more for saving money than saving people and planet from toxic sludge. And apparently, the combination of these two issues, according to Enbridge's own testimony, has resulted in 10 times as many corrosion anomalies per mile than any other Enbridge pipeline in the same corridor. Which means, among other things, that over 70% of the 140,000 pipe joints are experiencing external corrosion. And as Laura Kennett, Pipeline Asset Integrity Project Supervisor, testified in January of this year, I consider Line 3 to be in the deterioration stage, as external corrosion growth is increasing in an exponential fashion. Therefore, Line 3 is on a path of ever-increasing repairs to mitigate operating risk until it is replaced. In other words, this old timer can't be saved and will need to be taken out of playing its key role in forwarding our ever-accelerating race to climate catastrophe. Which on the face of it could almost come across as good news, right? This defective from the get-go oil pipeline that since only 1990 has at least 15 large spills of more than 50 barrels of oil each, plus a number of unreported small spills that I, uh, I guess, we'll never know. Fuck it. This pipeline that in 1991 ruptured near Grand Rapids, Michigan, spilling over 1.7 million gallons of oil. This pipeline that in 2007 exploded during repairs, killing two employees. This pipeline that in 2010 leaked 3,784 barrels of oil in North Dakota. Yes, this pipeline is literally beyond repair and the company is openly admitting it, suggesting it be shut down. So that's good news, right? No, because as Kenneth testified, until it is replaced. Meaning that this is some new and very old news that we gotta dig into. Originally slated to carry 750,000 barrels of oil a day, Line 3 is operating at just over half its capacity due to the issues that we just covered. Which is really 410,000 barrels too much considering the damn thing is literally rotting into the ground. But hey, who's counting? Well, Enbridge is, because they are now missing out on some roughly 14.3 million gallons of oil per day. Therefore, their plan is to uh, build a new pipeline, which shouldn't really be known as a replacement because, um, get this, they're just going to leave the old pipeline in the ground. Fuck it. This corroding, contaminated heap of filth will be left to decay into the ground while Enbridge embarks on a $7.5 billion brand new pipeline project that will cut through much of the same already damaged land plus some brand new land. Not least of all, land that includes shallow aquifers, as yet clean groundwater, permeable soil types, and the largest wild rice beds in North America. Meanwhile, the pipeline would, like its predecessor, slice through Ojibwe Treaty lands, this time endangering even more indigenous lands and people for the sake of oil. Sound familiar? Well, it might not come as a huge surprise that Enbridge owns 28% of the Dakota Access Pipeline. You know, the, the one that sprang a leak even before it was fucking operational? The one that uh, where we boldly proved George Carlin Wright, who once said that the U.S. is just an oil company with an army? Yeah, that very same one. And incidentally, Enbridge is also the proud recipient of the second largest Clean Water Act fine in U.S. history, a cool $62 million. Last year, Enbridge was ordered to shell out $172 million in fines related to a 2010 pipeline spill near Marshall, Michigan, where 20,000 barrels of oil from the Enbridge Line 6B gushed into the Kalamazoo River. Apparently, the other $110 million will go to safety improvements, which feels fittingly vague for a company that has left a leaking, decaying pipeline snuggled in the earth for more than 50 years. Fun fact here, as of June 30th of this year, Enbridge reported adjusted earnings of $662 million Canadian dollars, or roughly $519 million U.S. dollars. 
That means that Enbridge shelled out less than what they make in one fucking month for the irreparable damage of the 6B oil pipeline spill, and that the second largest Clean Water Act fee ever levied against a company is quite literally less than 12% of what they make in three months. Wow. With those sort of numbers, it's really no surprise that fossil fuel companies give less than one shit about gross malfeasance. It costs them next to nothing, when and even if they ever get fined. It seems that oil company with an army is hesitant to fine oil companies. That's bizarre. And this is why people in the old and new path of the Line 3 project have been and are standing up for their rights to clean land, water, air, and indeed life. Last week, we sat down with two indigenous youth activists, Nolan and Nina Berglund, who have taken to land and water in order to raise awareness of and resistance to this pipeline project. Called Paddle to Protect, this three-week-long trip that began this past weekend highlights the path of the Line 3, the importance of the land and water to both indigenous people's lives and livelihoods, and the importance of our solidarity work with indigenous people as they stand always on the front lines of this oil company and the army that protects it. Take a look. Well, we're in a youth group called the Indigenous Youth Ceremonial Mentoring Society. And um, within the group, we went on a trip to Whitewater, Wisconsin to go to a, um, what was the name? It was a youth, and it, the official title was Indigenous Youth um, March and Training but there wasn't much indigenous youth. Yeah. <laughs> We're the only indigenous youth, but um, that's what that's what they called it. And um, they introduced line three to us along with line 67, um, kind of just giving us information about like um, what it is, like how it's impacting our communities. And we were like, what? Like, cause that was like, we just- We didn't know nothing about yeah, it before Yeah, we, we were just like, um, like we knew about Standing Rock and went out there and like we knew a bunch about Dapple and then all of a sudden we get like, um, talk to you about these pipelines that are going through like our home states and we're like what the heck ever since we've learned about it like um, we've tried bringing as much awareness into our community as much as we can whether it's um, banners um, just teaching our communities teachings we've done that um, just kind of talking to our friends talking to like our peers about it as well as educating ourselves yeah about it. because that's it's really important and especially like um since social media plays like a big part in how people receive their information, like we've been sure to um, kind of take information that's true and like what we know about it and like help teach people like, well, maybe you shouldn't believe that because and like, you know, the normal stuff that goes on with social media. Mm -hmm. What has been the, the what has been the response? So when when was this field trip, and what has been the response from both your community and the company or company representatives since you've started building awareness about this? Um, well, we went to Whitewater on March third, and then um, after learning about it, we on March seventh we went up north to Bemidji, uh, Minnesota, and um, went to a U.S. Department. Um, state meeting about like the tar sands pipeline border crossing and about of course line three and line 67 and um, We actually shut down that whole public hearing or the, the hearing the public the, hearing the, We kind of shut it down like us because we had a group of um, It was a bus full of people from the cities and different communities that come from especially up north in those Ojibwe, Ojibwe um, communities and we voiced our opinions out loud so the officials and the Enbridge representatives that were present there were able to hear what we had to say because we weren't just going to get ignored. So was there a response, <laughs> which is awesome, um, uh, was there a response after that from Enbridge? No, nothing. Mm -hmm. So wh where what are their pl where are they right now with the with the plans uh, and have they done any sort of um, I mean obviously they they haven't been doing any community outreach but have they been doing any sort of environmental impact studies or anything like that? We're um, we're actually um, us along with thir uh, okay we we're we're with a group of thirteen um, youth um, we're called like the youth climate interveners in the line three case of the certificate of need and discussing about the like the um, draft environmental statement and the environmental sta um, statement. So we're currently like um, working within the legal processes of um, how 
the PUC and like the um the like officials grant them like their um available like their per- yeah their their permits to build it actually so like we're we're involved with we got the opportunity to, to um become interveners and we actually got approved um not too long ago to be an official party within the intervening process so what does that look like what does that mean you want to explain it well <clears throat> it's kind of like uh, community members learning more about the legal process of how to go against companies like Enbridge and we're all kind of like doing our own kind of research on um, our own topics about how the pipeline affects our communities and the environment. Like our role within the intervening process is to provide a case in which um, how it affects us personally like how it directly affects us and uh, like our communities so um our group is kind of focusing like overall on climate change, but we um, we're I'm talking personally about how um, our lands are used ceremonially and how this how line three definitely threatens it, and we have to bring in as expert witnesses to um, like it's there's like a and it's an entire process that we have to go through with like information and we have to gather like a bunch of data and get like these key like these key witnesses and then we eventually have to go to like these evidentiary hearings these public hearings and we have to attend these as an official party talk about the the landscape because i was looking at the map and uh the wild rice lakes uh and it seems like the area which the pipeline would go through is just like a series of small interconnected bodies of water talk about the landscape and 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 how and 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 what in particular that is in your area i want to read from what i wrote but i feel like it's so like it's weird just like saying it i feel like it's like official and there's like computer (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, the, like you said, the line three will leak in the oil into these traditional rice lakes and disturb the one of the resources for this traditional food for the Ojibwe. And that just shows how one of the ways that this pipeline will be affecting the lifestyle that we strive to bring back as indigenous people. <clears throat> and when this pipeline spills into our water sources, it will expose thousands of cancer causing chemicals. And it will also be contaminating our water, of course. And <clears throat> that's of course a resource that we all need to survive and there are many spills that have already happened and many gallons of oil have already contaminated our water with the oil like we were just talking about like these um these areas that there have been spills that mm-hmm. there's li- like little to no life there like um animals you don't you don't, don't hear, hear you don't hear it it's just they're, silence, they're just yeah. not there because the ground the water that they once lived are is now poisoned, so they they can't even live like nor naturally how they're supposed to. It just destroys all signs of life there. Mm-hmm. And there's no uh, and and as I saw on the website, there's no indication that Enbridge has any uh, thoughts about cleaning up what they've already destroyed. Mm-mm. No. And we were just talking about how they're using us as guinea pigs. They're like literal. They're test sites, right? Yeah. Using the like. Um, seeing how far the oil has gone within a year and dumping more oil like oh well there's oil in the ground so let's see how far it's seeped in this year like using the people in which it's directly affecting as the human guinea pigs to like yeah and on top of like everything that these communities endure whether it's extreme poverty alcoholism all these different things that come with it and yet clean water isn't and a clean land isn't available and it's it's horrifying to think that these things are getting that Enbridge is getting away with these things and we're honestly just sick of we're sick of letting it happen so talk about the uh you know you say that you're sick of seeing it happen um what first alerted me to what you what this this issue in particular was the in the creative way that you're that you're just about to set out and uh, and and battle this paddle to protect. Explain the idea and the inspiration behind this. What is a uh, what significance about the distance, the route, the paddling, and the involvement and leadership of indigenous youth like yourselves? Um, what I said is 
<clears throat> uh, Paddle to Protect is a 250-mile canoe journey starting in the Mi Mississippi headwaters at Lake Itasca and ending in Big Sandy Lake. Indigenous people from all across Minnesota will be attending this journey, giving them a chance to be on the water, to pray, to honor the water, and to experience the beauty that Northern Minnesota has to offer. Using canoes to travel on the water is a traditional practice used by the Ojibwe people for thousands of years. I think it's important to keep indigenous youth like us interested and involved in leading journeys like this because our ancestors fought and died for the water and these lands. So it is our responsibility to honor them as well as protect what they fought for. What's the, important, the importance to you of specifically having youth in the canoes and not, not uh, like the overarching indigenous you know, elders, for example? What's the importance of having the youth out there in particular? Well, in our, <clears throat> in our belief that we believe that children are very sacred with our people and <clears throat> that we're born with like a certain power that we have as youth and empowerment inside us. So that's, that's why I, if you want to speak a little bit more about that. Well, um, it was the youth that started the whole thing mm -hmm. at Standing Rock and to kind of bridge it over to here in line three and to have the youth start up this this whole campaign against line three, it it's really powerful. And to have youth on the water, it just, it because indigenous youth have a very hard time dealing with historical trauma. That's something us indigenous people deal with and with high suicide rates, um, high alcoholism rates, drug, drug addiction, it, it's, it all adds up really bad within us native youth and to see um, native youth becoming empowered by not only being on the water, but fighting for their water, fighting for their land, fighting for their people. It's, it brings the whole community up as a whole, I believe. And, and of course have, we will be the leaders of tomorrow. All the youth will be the people leading this earth in the future. We'll be the ones directly impacted from the effects of this pipeline. So we'll be, we'll be the ones here 60 years later when that pipeline's no longer effective. So I think to have us, out there speaking our voices to not only Enbridge but the whole oil company, all these oil companies. It really we make a statement as a whole. So I want because specifically about what you just said, um, something that gets lost very, very much in American society is this idea of uh, of of healing. And it seems like water isn't just life in sort of the abstract. You know, like you drink it to survive. But it also has has a, a healing power. Is that part of the? Is that also part of uh, the importance of this uh, of this action for you? Definitely. Um, well, us as Native people, we use water as a ceremonial tool. So we have specific ceremonies for our water, with our water, using our water. We drink it to purify our bodies, to pur purify our minds and soul. So. It, it's a lot more than just drinking it and having it as a, a like a resource in which our body needs to survive, but we use it in a spiritual sense to connect. It's it's our way of connection with our spirits, with the land, and it's something that we've used ceremonially for thousands and thousands of years. And when that's at stake, a lot of it it brings a lot of attention to a lot of our ceremonial leaders and. For us youth to carry on those ceremonial ways, we need the water in which to to do that. So, um, what finally? What is um, what are your demands and what are next steps? I know you you mentioned that you are 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 going to be uh, offering up some uh, expert witnesses and and dealing with that. But what are some other next steps for both you and Enbridge? And what are your demands as you set out on this journey? <laughs> well, for one, we want the we do not want this new proposed line three to go through. As well as any pipelines. As well as any pipelines through our lands, but specifically to Ambridge, we want the existing line three to be cleaned up. For them to try to preserve the little amount of clean water that we still have on this earth. And what, uh, I mean, this, this, this is kind of a, a large question, but what can people do to help, in particular, you know, non-Indigenous people or people that are not in, in that area but would like to help with the, the Stop Line 3 project? Well, one thing I like to say is that people to keep themselves educated 
and <clears throat> to not be silent about issues like this. But Line 3 has a Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> Stop Line 3, and it has all of our um, fundraising information and stuff like that for our paddle, But and it has um, updates on Line 3, different um, events that are happening around Line 3. So um, I don't know how big the whole range of people is, but um, yeah, so, and there is um, StopLine3.org that is available for people okay. too. Um, and then just one more question. Sorry, the in, in terms of um, in terms of indigenous solidarity as well. Do you see yourselves going to some sort of uh, to eventually get to some sort of place where you're trying to block the actual construction, like what we saw at Standing Rock, or or what we're seeing happening in um, in, in uh, Illinois as well, where you have lots of indigenous groups coming together in solidarity for that. Oh, there's yeah, the, yeah, there's already there. yeah, there's already been um, camps established, and there's already been talk around if there needs that if it needs to go to that if it needs to go there, then that's what needs to happen because immediate action, immediate action and peaceful protest. For more on the Stop Line 3 initiative and the Paddle to Protect journey, visit StopLine3.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Dissent. Apologies for the rather slapdash processing of this episode. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Please spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide and the description to see the sites mentioned in this week's show, and be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. Also, for all of you podcast listeners out there, the Act Out podcast comes out every Friday, available on iTunes and Libsyn at actout.libsyn.com. Also, my book and I have performances and events scheduled in D.C., New York, and San Francisco. For more information on that, visit artkillingapathy.com slash performance. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, Donate at Occupy.com slash donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com slash Act Out. We got nowhere.